Now that we've talked about this idea that samples adjust the standard deviation to become what the standard error is, we're ready to do some inferential statistics. Inferential statistics take a look at the idea of how can the sample help us make an estimate or a conclusion about the entire population. And as you might guess, a sample and the population will have similar but different statistics or parameters. And so the question we're going to start this discussion off with is how close is a sample proportion to a population proportion? In other words, if I take a sample of 100 people and ask what, what number of them or what percent of them eat breakfast in the morning, I'll end up with a percentage of people in my sample who eat breakfast in the morning. That's a sample statistic. And I can use that to try and estimate what percent of the entire population or all people eat breakfast. That is the population parameter. However, the two numbers aren't going to be exactly the same. There will be some type of error involved in that proportion. So that's what we're going to look at today. How, what is that error, and how can we calculate it? First, I want to make sure we really understand this concept of proportion. When we're talking about proportions, what we're really saying is that the underlying distribution is binomial. And if you remember from our probability unit, binomial takes a look at x successes out of n trials. That's what we're looking at. So if we were asking about the breakfast example, we're looking at how many people eat breakfast, the successes, out of how many people total we're interviewing. And then from that, success and trial concept, we can calculate the population proportion, or I'm sorry, the sample proportion, which we represent as p hat with the little uh, triangle over the p. We calculate that by taking the successes divided by the trials to get some type of percentage, proportion, or decimal. And it turns out that proportions are normally distributed with a mean that's equal to the proportion and a standard error that's the square root of the proportion times the probability of failure divided by the sample size. And again, that q hat, q is failure, the opposite of successes, so it's 1 minus the proportions. This underlying distribution will allow us to estimate where the actual population parameter lies. To do that, we will find what's called a confidence interval. A confidence interval is an interval maybe between 20 and 30%. That's an interval. Based on the sample statistic, where the population parameter is likely to be located. So it's going to be this range of numbers where we are quite confident the actual population parameter lies. And the idea behind it is that our sample statistic is 
is likely not perfect. It's likely off by some error. And so what we'll do to calculate this interval is we'll say, OK, let's take the sample proportion, and we'll subtract the error. And then we'll take the sample proportion and add the error. And the population parameter is likely somewhere between those two numbers. So we take our sample statistic and add and subtract the error. And that should give us a range of numbers where the population proportion actually lies. But how big is that error? Well, we don't really know. What we have to do is we have to say we're going to be comfortable with some level of confidence or some level of error that's allowed to occur. And if we're OK with being wrong 5% of the time, we'll make what's called a 95% confidence interval. If we're OK being wrong 10% of the time, we'll make what's called a 90% confidence interval. So the confidence kind of tells us how often we're, we want to be correct and accepts a certain amount of error. Because we can never be 100% confident unless we interview everybody. So we've got this idea of a confidence level. And that's going to be the probability the interval contains the population parameter. We'll have some type of confidence level. Let's say, for example, I want to have a 95% confidence level. That means I want to be right 95% of the time. But I could be wrong. We have this alpha, which is a Greek letter. The Greek letter alpha is the probability we are wrong. And so if we want to be 95% confident, alpha is going to be 1.0 minus the 0.95. Alpha is going to be 0 0.05, a 5% probability that we are wrong. Visually on the normal curve, what that means is if my sample proportion comes in in the middle of the normal curve, we're going to put a range, the proportion minus the error and the proportion plus the error. And we want to be somewhere in the middle. We're claiming the population proportion is somewhere in that range. So in that range, that's my confidence level, the 95%, which means out in the tails is where I could be wrong if it actually falls out there. Well, if there's 5% in the tails and there's two tails, we could have 2.5% splitting it in half in each tail. Our goal is going to be to figure out what that error amount is that we have to add and subtract in order to get 2.5% in each tail. That's what we're doing. So with proportions, to calculate the error, we have this nice formula that the error is equal to what we'll call z sub alpha over 2 times the square root of p hat q hat over n. This is a formula that we should be very comfortable using. <laughs>
P hat, Q hat, and N we should be familiar with because those all come from our sample. We've already talked about those before. This Z sub alpha over 2 value, that is the Z value that gives the correct area in each tail. So for this example up above where I wanted a 95% confidence interval, that would be the z value that gave me 2.5% in each tail. And we can look that up in the table backwards, or we can consider some common z sub alpha over 2 values. Because really, most confidence intervals come in one of three types. We have confidence levels of either 90%, 95%, or 99%. And the z sub alpha over 2 that goes with each of them, with the 90% to get 10% in the tails, 5% in each tail, we'll use 1.645. For the 95% confidence interval, like the example up above, we'll use 1.960. And for a 99% confidence interval, it turns out the z sub alpha over 2 is 2.576. You do not need to memorize these numbers, but you should have them handy as you're doing your assignments and, this, and the practices and labs for our class. OK, I think we're in need of an example so that we can see this work out, so we can see how we find out how big the error is between our sample statistic and population proportion. And once we know the error, how do we find a confidence interval that contains, or likely contains, the actual population parameter? Let's do an example. A survey is done and 95 out of 174 voters support a particular candidate for Senate. The first thing we're going to do is we are going to construct a 90% confidence interval. For the true proportion, of voters who support the candidate. Can this candidate be 90% confident that, that she or he has a majority of the voter support? Well, first we need to know what is the proportion p hat that we're dealing with. We have to calculate this. The proportion is our number of successes out of the number of trials. 95 out of 174 voters support the candidate. That comes out to a proportion of 0.546, or 54% of the voters in the survey support this candidate looks pretty good. Q hat, the probability of failure is always 1 minus the proportion. So in this case, 1 minus 0.546, which comes out to be 0.454. We also need a z sub alpha over 2, or in this case, Alpha is the probability of failure, 0.10 over 2, which gives us z of 
because we want 10% in the tails. Oops, not 0 0.5, 5 percent in each tail. And so we would need to find the z value that puts 5 percent area in each tail. We can look that up on our big z table, or that is one of the common ones that we have from our chart up above. So we will use z sub 0.05 is equal to 1.6. Four, five. Those are the three pieces that we will need in order to build our confidence interval. The error between our sample proportion and the population proportion is equal to the z sub alpha over 2 times the square root of p hat q hat over n. Z sub alpha over 2 is 1.645 times the square root of p hat, which is 0.546, times q hat, which is 0.454, divided by n, the sample size of 174. And when you do this on your calculator, for some reason, it's really common students forget to multiply by the 1.645. They just do the square root. Make sure you do the whole thing. And you should end up with an error of 0 0.06. Let's round it to 0 0.062. This is how much my sample might be off at 90% confident. We're 90% confident our sample might be off by about 6%. So we will take the sample proportion and subtract the error to get the lower bound of the worst case scenario for this candidate. And we'll do our proportion plus the error to get our upper bound to get our best case scenario for this candidate. Our proportion was 0.546 minus 0.062 the error. And 0.546 plus 0.062, the error. And when we subtract, we end up with 0.484. And when we add, we end up with 0 0.608. And this range is where the population parameter, or the population proportion, likely lies in between. Let's make a better way of saying that, though. Let's look at how we interpret a confidence interval. Interpreting a confidence interval is almost as important as how we calculate it, because our statistics don't mean anything unless we can put it in context of the situation. So what we will say to interpret a confidence interval, and this becomes a nice script for interpreting any confidence interval we do in this class, is we will say we estimate with some percentage, that would be your confidence level, whatever your confidence level is, with some percentage confidence that the true, let's actually say that the true population whatever we're talking about. We're going to put the parameter in context. So we're talking about the population mean, the population proportion, the population standard deviation, whatever we're talking about. But then we'll put it in context of the situation we're describing is between blank and blank. And those would be, as you might expect, the low number 
and the high number. So for our proportion, we're going to interpret the confidence interval from the example above. And you can still see it at the top of your screen there in purple. The confidence interval is 0 0.484, 0 0.608. But what that means in context is that we can estimate, notice how I follow the script here. We estimate with, and this one was a 90% confidence interval, so 90% confidence that the true population, and now I'm going to describe the parameter in context. We're doing proportions here. What proportions support this candidate for Senate? That the true population proportion who support the candidate for Senate. Notice that puts it completely in context so we know what the problem was discussing is between and the low number, let's go ahead and make it a percent, 48.4% and 60.8%. And that's how we will interpret that confidence interval. We're 90% confident the true population proportion who support the candidate for Senate is between 48.4% and 60.8%. So it's not a guarantee this candidate's going to get a majority. You might say it's pretty likely, but we don't know where in between these numbers the actual proportion's going to lie. We just know it's going to be between those numbers, or at least we're 90% confident it's between those numbers. So you should be able to today build a confidence interval using the formulas for proportions that we talked about today. And then just as important, you should be able to interpret that confidence interval using the script we've provided here. So you can go ahead and take a look at a couple of those and try them. We'll look forward to discussing confidence intervals more in class and continuing to work with them in inferential statistics. We'll see you in class.